Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. A speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush, Andrew Ferguson is a senior editor at the Weekly Standard, the author of Fool's Names and Land of Lincoln. Andy's most recent book is entitled Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course in Getting His Kid into College. Andy, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Peter. Crazy You, I quote, the subject of college admissions entangle our deepest yearnings, our vanities, our social ambitions and class insecurities, and most profoundly, our love and hopes for our children. With the largest questions of democracy, of equality, fairness, opportunity, the social good, even the nature of happiness. Andrew, how did you come to write this book? Well, uh, as, I, as I say towards the beginning there, what happened was, um, all of a sudden, things started arriving in the mail that I wasn't expecting. And it was um, brochures, which I now realize are called view books. Colleges call them view books. View books. And they started clogging my email <laughs> and my, um, my real post uh, box there on the front of our house. And uh, I realized that my son was being solicited, like he was a sailor in dry docks or something. And, uh, these things were so expensive and uh, expensively produced. They were on this thick kind of paper like a rubber tree plant leaf. Or you didn't know whether you were supposed to read it or slurp it like a giraffe. And uh, the whole thing was clearly designed for a boy of our financial class and his academic achievements. They knew you. They knew him. Right, which and I didn't somewhere know somewhere in some database he existed. Yeah, and uh, that was one of the things that got me on is how did they know so much about my son? And I found the answer to that, which is sort of unnerving too. But anyway, I realized all of a sudden that this thing was totally different from the process I'd known when I was a kid. Which was? Which was, uh, I think I, uh, I was living in Chicago, growing, grew up there with my parents, and. Um, realized that I wanted to get as far away from Chicago as I could and still remain in the contiguous United States, which meant California. And uh, so I went to the uh, library. There was a little book of colleges. There was no U.S. news rankings. There was no Fisk guide. There were none of these elaborate things that you can get on the web. And I thought, okay, there's these five schools there, and I'll just apply to them. And I sent away a little note to them all, and they came back with a little tiny application, one page, and I sent that off, and some of them I got into and some of them I didn't, and that was it. And my parents said they could afford this one, but not that one, and so there we were. So off you went to California. Yes, but that's not, that's not the way it is. So how did they know so much about your son? Well, uh, there is a huge industry attached to the business of higher education a sort of parasitic industry. It's kind of a big carbuncle. Um, and a, you admire a, it profoundly. A, a large chunk of it is uh, devoted to uh, information that is gathered on the PSATs, which are the practice SATs that kids take when they're uh, freshman, sophomore year. Just about every kid takes it in the United States, every college-bound kid. And before they take that test, and they're sitting there in their classrooms and their little desks, and they have to say what their interests are, what kind of uh, classes they'll like to take in college, what sort of um, part of the country they would like to live in, would they like to go to a campus where there's uh, a lot of freedom and lifestyle, or would they like to go to one that's more rigid, and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So by the time all this has the feel of the mandatory about it. The kid yeah, just well, doesn't I, know well, any well, better, you, right? Yeah, you can opt out, uh, but you know you're what, what, you're a fifteen-year-old year old right, kid, and right. you're just um, and so these this enormous amount of data is uh, gathered uh, both by private firms and by the college board, and then it is sold to colleges at about thirty cents a name. So a college can say, you know, I want somebody who wants to go to a conservative campus and really wants to study abroad and is interested in equestrian studies, whatever. And so by God, tap, 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 and then out comes, you know, what, 3,000 names. And so they can target their mailing, as we were getting in our mailbox, to, to these kids. You know, it's, it's almost, I mentioned this to professional marketers, it's almost beyond their wildest dreams. If you were a marketer and you knew the name 
and location of every, so let's say you, were, you wanted to sell cars. You knew the name and location of every person who wanted to buy a car next year. Ford you Motors should be so lucky. You knew exactly yeah. what kind of stick shift they wanted or uh, upholstery on the uh, seats. Uh, th th people would kill for that kind of thing. Uh, so it's one of the one of the ways that the industry is like every other industry, but also very unlike every other industry. Crazy you. A decade after the Morrill Act of 1862 became law, Morrill Act expanding college education, slightly less than 2% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 21 were in college. 2%. Today the figure is more than 60%. How did that happen? Well, it's a great democratizing impulse on the part of Americans, and um, after the, especially after World War II, there was the famous GI Bill, which is based on the idea that the that the men who had been defending us and uh, trying to keep us free deserved whatever kind of future they could build, and so they were entitled to go to college, um, pretty much gratis. There was there were little fees involved here and there. But anyway, so we had an entire generation of people who never would have thought about going to college, going to college. Mm -hmm. um, and it became an expectation of the American middle class. This whole process got distorted when the people who were running the education establishment realized that they had started to build enormous dormitories and classrooms and, uh, you know, gyms and things like that. But there was going to be a tremendous drop off in the number of kids who were going to be applying to college in the late 70s. So they had all of this capacity. Baby boom burst goes through. Right. And then it drops. And then, yeah, and they're left with this, all this capacity. So they realize we have to get customers. This is going to become a highly competitive situation. So that's when these marketing gimmicks started and, and the intense salesmanship that you see. 